Nintendo fans, it's Jay Wits here, and today we're going to talk about a board game. As you guys know, I love board games. Absolutely cherish them. I don't care if it's a family game or a hardcore game. If I can bring something down to the table and make even remotely interesting strategy decisions, I'm going to have a good time. That being said, a lot of those classic games from our childhood also leave a pretty bitter taste by the time you're done with them. I'm talking classic games like The Settlers of Catan and Monopoly. These are all about horrible dice rolls that can just destroy you. Land on a wrong property or never get to buy properties and you're done. The stuff that you're trying to produce never gets rolled or people roll sevens and destroy you, you're done. But today, I wanna to talk about a game that has pained me even more than both of those two combined. And believe it or not, to go there, we get to visit the world of Pokemon. This is Pokemon Master Trainer and it will destroy you. Right off the bat, Pokemon Master Trainer was compelling to me as a kid because it just has so much stuff. There's a huge map of Kanto as your board, tons of item and event cards based on things from the games, and lots, I mean lots, of unique Pokemon chips. There's a chip for every single first generation Pokemon. 150 colorful coins for you to collect, trade, slam! Oh wait, that was Pogs. But in short, because Pogs were so popular and Pokemon was so popular, this game was just really appealing to kids in the 90s. Unfortunately, one thing I barely did in the 90s was actually play this game correctly. In the same way that a lot of kids never actually played the real Pokemon trading card game with their own cards when growing up, most of my friends just made up the rules as they went with this one. It's no Twilight Imperium, but it is a mildly complicated game for kids to play. And the adults that were able to comprehend all those rules didn't want to play the game because they didn't understand a thing about Pokemon or evolution lines. For the few of us that did learn the rules from front to back though, we quickly learned that we had opened Pandora's box. Pokemon Master Trainer, while charming and cute on the exterior, is a cruel, chaotic, long game where players consistently backstab each other with no mercy! Players have the choice of playing as Ash, Ash Ketchum, Satoshi, Gary's rival, this kid, and the guy from the anime that looks a little bit like Red. Just like the main franchise, players go on their journey from Pallet Town with a starter Pokemon to help them battle and capture a team on the long road to becoming a master trainer. Because this game is for up to six players, they had to take a few liberties in adding the starter Pokemon beyond the classic four. You've got Bulbasaur, Charmander, Squirtle, Pikachu, Meowth, and Clefairy? And it does matter which chip you randomly get, because some of them are literally better than others. Each chip in this game has two values. The big number is your power points. Your entire team must have at least 20 total points to enter the Indigo Plateau at the end of the game. The small number below is your base attack value, which represents strength in battle. For some cruel reason, not all starters are created equal. Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle are the only starters with four attacks. But for some reason, Bulbasaur gets shafted and only has four power points instead of five. But if you're stuck with any of the other three chips, good luck. They all have only three power points and three attack. On top of that, the non-OG three are also the only starters that only evolve once, giving them even less overall potential. We'll get to the evolution mechanic in a second, but in general, this game immediately gives you a reason to despise the people around you. The lowest power point player gets a very small concession prize by getting to go first, and then you're off to the races. The opening section of the game, the calm before the storm, is actually pretty enjoyable. You start by rolling your dice on a linear path, collecting items, triggering event cards, and attempting to collect Pokemon along the way. Once you hit Cerulean City, the world opens up and you actually have the freedom to choose your direction of travel and hop between the different cities. The core gameplay, almost half of the spaces on the board, are wild Pokemon that grow stronger the deeper you get in the game, rising in strength from pink to green to blue to red, and finally the mysterious yellow legendary chips. When you land on a Ketchum space, you flip the Pokemon over and attempt to capture it. If you roll any of the numbers shown on the chip, you add it to your team. If not, too bad. It remains face up for another player to potentially snag. Event spaces pull a random card from the green deck, which can activate anything from healing to legendary Pokemon encounters. Item spaces give you items, which fill your maximum hand size of seven, offering you tools to aid in captures, battles, and more. Both of these piles offer some absurd benefits that completely break the game. Typically, only one trainer can take up a space at a time, but at any given point, if you pass by another player, you have the option of stopping next to that player to offer a trade or declare a battle. Trading in this instance rarely works. You offer a deal that doesn't include one of your starter Pokemon, and the other player has the option to accept or decline it if they don't like it. It's usually declined. 
The far more sinister way to trade, though, is the Trade Event card. This one allows the Team Rocket School of Trades. You put a gun to your opponent's head and force them to trade with you, no matter how lopsided the offer is. Magikarp from Mewtwo? It doesn't matter! If you don't have the Pokédoll item in your hand to protect you from these cards, your best Pokémon could be stolen from you at any moment. Battles are a bit more unique. Two players compete by throwing up a single Pokémon of their choice and entering a competition of numbers. It's a battle for the highest overall number. Each player starts with the base attack strength at the bottom of your Pokémon chip. You'll also get a bonus if you have a complete evolution set. Plus three points if you have a set of two, and plus five if you have a full set of three. Then, each player can commit up to two attack bonus cards in secret. Finally, each player rolls a die and adds the number that they rolled to their total power. Once you've added your ludicrous combination of cards, chips, and bonuses together, the highest number wins two item cards at random from the losing player's hand, and the losing player has to flip their battler over, losing it from their power point total until you've revived it. Believe it or not, I think that's every major rule in the game. You'll travel in a pack throughout the land, searching far and wide for powerful items, events, and Pokémon in your quest to 20 power points. There'll be plenty of rude exchanges through mandatory battles and trades, but what really crushes your soul is the end game, the Indigo Plateau. Pokémon Master Trainer is a race. You're scrambling to be the first player to collect 20 power points worth of Pokémon, enter the plateau, and beat a member of the Elite Four to claim victory. The biggest problem is that the odds are stacked against you the entire time. For starters, just entering the Indigo Plateau doesn't buy you a challenge. Nah, you enter a 14-space purgatory ring with only two openings to actually attempt the final challenge, so it can take several turns before you even get to start. Once you finally land on an entry point, your final battle begins with one of five randomly selected challengers. This is it! This is the tensest moment! And that's when you realize, this game doesn't mess around. Battling works the same. Your base power plus evolution bonuses plus up to two bonus cards plus one die roll. Your opponent gets something like this. Here's Agatha. There are two trainers stronger than her and two trainers weaker than her. She's right in the middle. I figured I'd show you guys the average. These trainers get a base value, a die roll bonus, and an additional bonus on top of what they rolled. I'm gonna try and paint a realistic scenario for how the end game usually goes. You were lucky enough to find a legendary chip, which has nine power. While the maximum power you can get in the game comes through the evolution bonuses, they're really hard to actually maintain because of all the mandatory trades which can break up your lines throughout the game. As far as power cards go, the best you can usually hope for is around eight total bonus power. There are very few plus five and plus four cards in the deck, so getting plus eight from two cards is pretty dang good. That will give you 17 power, plus whatever you rolled on your die. I'm gonna save you the math here and just spell out what Agatha's results mean for you. If she rolls a three, four, five, or six in this situation, it doesn't even matter what you roll. You won't have a high enough total to beat her. All four of those rolls will give her 23 or higher points. Long story short, you can have a good offensive bonus, a legendary Pokémon, roll a six, and still only have a one in three chance of beating the third best endgame trainer. It gets worse. Let's say you rolled a six. That gives you 23 total power, and Agatha rolls a measly one, cutting her down to just 19. You win, right? Time machine! Wait, wh what was that? Time machine! This card. This insane card takes what little hope you once had and shatters it. It allows any player to force a reroll from anywhere. Reroll your own stuff, reroll your opponent's stuff, reroll the Elite Four roll, reroll an attack, movement, an attempt to capture, whatever you want. The moment someone has won the game, you're typically met with one or more of these bad boys, instantly rerolling whatever gives you the biggest chance to lose. Winning against any of these trainers is already rough. Don't even get me started on Gary, who averages a gargantuan 25.5 power after his roll. But when your opponents can force a re-roll at any given time, smell you later. Every time someone loses, their Pokémon's knocked out, they're kicked out of the Indigo Plateau, and they have to try and roll their way back in all over again. It's the Poké Hunger Games out there. You're trying to save valuable time machines and plus five power cards, but if you don't have a Poké doll, you might get battled, forcing you to lose items from your hand. The seven card hand maximum prevents you from having everything you could ever want at once. Or maybe your best Pokemon gets traded away and there's nothing you can do to block it. The deck is stacked against you, and if everyone is playing to win, you're gonna be in for a long night. May the odds be ever in your favor.
I played this game with a couple of bright friends recently, and it ended up taking us four and a half hours before a player was crowned champion. But, despite its cruelty, the insanely broken force trades, the time machines, and the questionably powerful endgame trainers, I've gotta say, I usually have fun when I play this game. You definitely need the right group to play it though. One that's not gonna take it too seriously, one that's cool trash talking and betrayal, and one that knows the frustratingly long RNG heavy experience that they're about to jump into. But with that kind of group of friends and a lot of time, it's a blast. It's a comedy of errors. You'll laugh every time someone whips a big roll or gets time machined into the Shadow Realm. You'll lose so many battles, it'll begin to make sense that every single player is forced to play as Ash Ketchum. And most of all, you'll reminisce about the fun times that you've had through Pokemon over the years. Insanely questionable design aside, it's just really fun to revisit Pallet Town and see what new adventure is in store for you. It's deceptively kid-friendly. <laughs> it's deceptively friendly, period. This is not a friendly game. But I've got to say, every time I crack this baby open, I actually end up having a pretty good time. If you have a copy of this that's just been sitting around since the 90s, or you have a friend with a copy of this, I highly recommend checking it out. You need to know what you're getting yourself into. You need to just accept that it's going to be a treacherous, backstabbing, painful journey. But if you're willing to accept that and you love Pokemon, I think that you're actually going to have a pretty fine day with this one. This isn't even the only game in the Pokemon Master Trainer set. There's actually a second and third generation version of the game, and both of them are slightly different from what I can tell. If you guys enjoy this video and it gets enough traction, I would love to check those ones out as well in the future, or really any other kind of Nintendo-themed board game that exists. There's a ton of them that I've never played. I'm sure they are equal parts trash and treasure, and I just think it would be fun. I love board games, and this was a really fun, different style of video to do. I hope that you guys enjoyed it, and as always, I'll see you guys next time with more Nintendo content.